Hello and welcome to the Holocaust Museum and Cohen Education Center's Teachers Workshop on Genocide. My name is Sam Parrish, Director of Operations and Education Specialist, and I will be hosting this series throughout the year. I'd like to first and foremost give thanks to the Commissioner's Task Force on Holocaust Education. I'd like to give thanks to the Merrill Color Educator Series here locally at the Holocaust Museum and Cohen Education Center. Installments of this series are going to be posted on a monthly basis. Um, it will be on the first of each month, beginning July 1st, 2020, and then thereafter each month for the foreseeable future. These will be recorded sessions. The first installment, the one we're working on today, is titled Genocides and Unfortunately More. Uh, the more part includes crimes against humanity, ethnic cleansing, and war crimes. And throughout the series, I'm going to refer to genocide and mass human rights violations. The latter is going to contain crimes against humanity, uh, war crimes, and ethnic cleansing. All materials are going to be located on a folder on our website by session. This session, session one, will have its own designated folder, and in it will be all the materials that you, uh, you might want all the materials that I reference. So it'll be URLs, website addresses, it'll be definitions, terms, worksheets, PowerPoints, etc. So how do you get to our website? Our website is located at www.hmcec.org. In order to get to the teacher's workshop series, you'll need to go to the education tab, which drops down to teachers, and then across to teachers' workshops. My email address is sam, S-A-M, at hmcec.org. Again, each session is going to be posted on the first of the month and can be a standalone, um, standalone session, although I hope you'll be able to attend after this first one, the rest of them, so they kind of work, in, uh, work together. So any mispronunciation I make is unintentional. I'll make my best effort to do uh, to make this accurate as possible, but just know that it is unintentional. Our mission is to teach the lessons of the Holocaust to inspire action against bigotry, hatred, and violence. I look forward to working with you as we apply those lessons um, that can be gleaned by studying the Holocaust, and we apply them to these other genocides as well to see if we can find unfortunate trends. Uh, by doing so, we will identify trends, I believe, uh, that will hopefully allow us to foresee hotspots, potential genocides that are taking place in our lifetime, in our world, and then maybe do something to help prevent them. Lastly, no subject matter, photographs, video clips, interviews, written materials, and more is graphic. So if you're going to use this with students, please, I'll ask that you please preview this information first. So today's agenda is we're going to look at the approach and the goals for the series, um, handling the numerous terminology, definitions. We will look into Stanton's 10 stages of genocide. We will, all, and then we'll conclude with an activity on the Geneva Conventions. We're going to look at a YouTube video. We'll look at a PowerPoint and a worksheet. All this can be interactive, and we will see a couple other stops along the way that we can use for, uh, for student interactions if, if that's what you're looking for. All right, so the approach. We're going to overview examples of genocide and mass human rights violations by providing a summary of its history, and from there we will have, again, um, interviews if they're available, photographs if available, uh, quotes by perpetrators, bystanders, victims, and hopefully upstanders. That will be our ultimate goal, of course, is to look for upstanders. Uh, each, each of these sessions will include an activity or more that can be applied with students. The activities will be designed uh, simply enough that they can be done in class as a whole class discussion. They can be done if your students are able to sit at different tables, collections of tables, pods, and can also be done remotely. So in remote uh, breakout sessions, for example. The goal, 
Part of the history of this will be confirming the philosophy or philosophies of governance that kind of led to, existed during, and that immediately followed the event that we're talking about. In order to do that, we're going to need to define terms and a list of those terms, which we'll see are located in the folder, session one folder on the website under teachers workshops. Once we have a level of comfort with those terms, um, we will track along the way the system or systems of governance that we're using, see if trends emerge. We may ultimately see both sides of the political spectrum are represented, represented in these genocides and mass human rights violations. Interestingly, if we go beyond those poles, I think what we'll see is that something shared in common, and that is the idea of totalitarianism. So that may be what we end up really focusing on and seeing if that trend emerges throughout this year plus long study of different genocides and human rights, mass human rights violations. Uh, the hope actually maybe is seeing that, that we bridge the gap that is contemporary here in the United States, the left-right paradigm. Maybe we bridge that gap just a little bit by, by doing this study. Lastly, the Geneva Convention. Uh, this is where we will really get into the sort of a hands-on in-class activity, um, again, whether live or remote. And um, we will see how the Geneva Conventions, the Hague Conventions, protocols, and so forth, were all efforts to help prevent the types of events that we're looking at. In order to begin a study, of course, of genocide, we need to look at a brief history of the word and, and how that term came to be. So Raphael Lemkin and the term genocide. So let's look into the term genocide a little bit through a background on Lemkin. Raphael Lemkin was born in 1900 in Lithuania. This area of Lithuania became Poland after World War I. World War I, 1915 to 1918, and within that context, the Armenian Genocide. 1921, Lemkin entered law school, timing that with the killing of Mehmed Talat. The asterisk indicating that we will see more about Talat in 1933, Lemkin wrote a paper that he submitted to a conference in Madrid. The conference was on penal law. He wanted international leaders to look into creating a law that prevented the destruction, as he called it, the destruction of groups of people based on religious or ethnic identity, something that he called at the time, quote, vandalism, end quote, and, quote, acts of barbarism, end quote. So we see that this is a kind of an obvious initial stage of Lemkin's development of the concept and then the term genocide. 1941, a couple years into World War II, Prime Minister Winston Churchill, when discussing the topic of the extermination of Jews, Sinti and Roma, then called gypsies, and others, stated that what, what was happening was, quote, a crime without a name, end quote. 1944, Raphael Lemkin gave it a name. He published Axis Rule in Occupied Europe, and this is where he introduced the word genocide, combination of the Greek genos for family and side, Latin for kill. Now, with this kind of background information, we could do a student activity. Some questions that can be asked, and these questions will be listed as a separate worksheet PDF in the session one folder. Some questions that you can come up with, of course, as an introductory are, what is genocide? Another question, question two, how is law applied to genocide and other hum, uh, mass human rights violations? How can that be applied internationally? A switch now is how can the creation of a word, the coining of a new word, affect people? How can it affect their attitudes and their approaches? Um, another switch. Sovereignty. This will be one of the terms that we define that's on our, our uh, list of terms that is located in session one's folder. So we need to define sovereignty and then ask if it can sometimes stand in the way of preventing genocide and mass human rights violations, or conversely, does, does the, the presence of sovereignty allow it to happen, potentially allow uh, genocide or um, mass human rights violations to occur? 
where do we draw the line on sovereignty? When is it right to in intervene either nationally or internationally? When is it a duty to intervene? Who can intervene or who should intervene? Uh, so all questions based on, on the concept of so sovereignty. So genocide and its application, the idea of the word itself, a separate kind of idea, sovereignty, a separate idea, and then what is Raphael Lemkin's legacy? Another, another thing to look at. So, so seven questions, but they can be broken up, and that could be a, a, a half a class activity, again, done remotely or live. Let's look at the connection between Mehmed Talat, the killing of, and Raphael Lemkin, the coining of the term, the concept of genocide. Mehmed Talat was the Ottoman Minister of the Interior during World War I, and therefore during the Armenian Genocide. If you come forward post-World War I to 1921, Mehmed Talat was living in Germany under an assumed name. That name was Said. Ali Bey. Bey and his wife were walking through a very nice neighborhood of Berlin. A man tapped Bey on the shoulder. Bey turned around and the man, pictured here, shot Bey in the head, instantaneously killing him. The man, pictured here, also shot Bey's wife. It's important to keep in mind that Bey and his wife were in Germany being protected in a way because Germany and the Ottoman Empire during World War I and the Armenian Genocide were allied. Passersby saw the event take place, the killing of Bey and the shooting of Bey's wife and sprang to action to their credit. They rounded up and captured and detained the killer. In fact, they were so vigorous in this that um, the police who arrived may actually have saved the killer's life from what we would call in the Old West frontier justice or some sort of citizen's justice. The man when arrested said, it is not, quote, it is not I who am the murderer, it is he, end quote. The assassin was Sagaman Tellerian. I will refer to him as Tellerian from this point forward. So Tellerian, again, pictured here, was an Armenian Christian. He stated to the police at the time that the man was not named Saeed Ali Bey, but instead was Mehmed Talat, who was nicknamed the, quote, big boss, end quote. Later, Tellerian uh, recounted his eyewitness account of what took place, quote, this is Tellerian, quote, in 1915, the Armenian populace of Azerum was suddenly alarmed by the news that the Turkish government planned violent measures. Shortly afterwards, the populace was herded together and driven off in columns under the conduct of Turkish soldiers. After being robbed of their money and their belongings, the massacre in which my family were victims took place. After I had seen my brother's skull split, I was hit on the head and lay unconscious probably one or two days. Evidence pro uh, provided at that trial showed that Talat had presided over the killing of approximately one million Armenians by firing squad, bayoneting, bludgeoning, and starvation. Talirian actually went on to describe the tactic that was used. This is a tactic that we will see repeated in various genocides and mass human rights violations during this, uh, during this series. First step, arrest leadership. So Armenian leadership was arrested and murdered. Step two, males of military age were driven from their villages, from their homes, and either killed immediately or sent to death camps. The third tactic, now, unprotected children, women, and the elderly were forced on death marches. During these death mar marches, special uh, units attacked them. They butchered them in the tens of thousands, these Armenians who were being death marched. Those who survived the, the sexual assaults, 
the beatings, the attacks, and in general, the hardships were then driven into the desert to starve and go without water. The above tactic, that tactic that, that Tellurian described during the Armenian genocide is one that we'll absolutely see in the Holocaust and also in the Cambodian genocide. And that's just at a couple of examples that come to mind. All right, so now how do we connect Mehmed Talat, his assassination, and Tellurian with Raphael Lemkin? Well, we said in 1921 that Lemkin was studying. He was studying law at the University of Lvov. And this was 1921 when this assassination took place. So it was a contemporary event, and Lemkin read about it. He asked his professor if Tellurian, the assassin, had attempted in some way to have Talat, the Minister of Interior, arrested. The professor said no. There was a lack of international law that could actually be applied to such events. He said, quote, there was no law under which he, that's Talat, could be arrested. He went on, consider the case of a farmer who owns a flock of chickens. He kills them, and this is his business. If you interfere, you are trespassing, end quote. Lemkin was shocked and replied, quote, but the Armenians are not chickens, end quote. The professor retorted, quote, you cannot interfere with the internal affairs of a nation without infringing on the nation's sovereignty. Lemkin concluded to his professor with a very poignant quote. He said, it is a crime for Tellurian to kill a man, but it is not a crime for his oppressor to kill more than a million men. This is most inconsistent. With all that information now, with, with that story of Talat and Tellurian and Lemkin woven together and how it could have led to the creation of the term genocide, um, some other student activities, some student questions that could be done, again, as potential whole classroom, um, group pod table activity, or even remote breakout sessions. Some questions, some basic questions. So now back to sovereignty. What limits, knowing this story, what limits could, would one want to place on sovereignty? Does, does someone, an individual, an institution, a nation, a state, have the right to do that? Who has the right to set those limits? What could be done to prevent these types of events? Um, what type of approval would an, a state, an institution need in order to take action? And then sadly, and kind of as a reflection, what options did a person like Tellurian, what, what options did he have since no law existed to prevent genocides and or uh, mass human rights violations. All right, so we, we know where the term came from now. We see a background of where that term came from. So now, and we've discussed these quite a bit, so I think it's appropriate at last to define them. So we will look at genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and ethnic cleansing. The place to do that is www.un.org. You locate the Atrocity Crimes tab. There's a drop down, and the first is Definitions, and then Genocide, Crimes Against Humanity, War Crimes, and Ethnic Cleansing. All right, so genocide. This, I extracted, I extracted the basics of the definition. I would highly recommend using the, the UN's website for doing this, but I did extract some basic information. So some things that we don't see here are that genocide was finally first recognized as a crime under inter international law in 1946. So the United Nations General Assembly in 1946 um, recognized genocide as a crime. It was not codified for two years. So in, 19, in the 1948 Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, which we call the Genocide Convention. It was then codified. The convention then was ratified. Uh, the definition was not without a great deal of negotiation 
and it reflects a lot of compromise among the United Nations members. And recall and remember that this definition was as of uh, 1948. So, um, important to look at the basics here of the definition, killing members of, of the group, of a group, causing harm, and that's whether it's physical or mental. We'll see the physical and mental issue come up in elements of the crime. They're typically physical and mental. They're also sometimes contextual, as we'll see with war crimes. Um, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions that would bring about its demise in whole or in part. Um, imposing measures intended to prevent births and forcibly transferring children from one group to another. What comes to mind, of course, with, um, with the last two is the Holocaust, the prevention of births, the idea of eugenics, and then the, um, the Lebensraum children who were forcibly transferred um, from places like Poland back to Germany. All right, so um, elements of crime, again, are mental. In other words, there is an intent to do one of these A through E components of the definition, and then the physical element, the actual act of doing that. So that's genocide. Again, I recommend looking further into the definition of genocide located here. It gives a little bit more in the background, and it kind of spells it out a little bit easier to see. Crimes Against Humanity, this page I understand is almost overwhelming to look at all the text. So again, I recommend you going to the UN's website for this. It's, there is a background of the history and what you will see is that it's not actually clear where this concept of crimes against humanity came from. Um, many states, nation states around the world have already criminalized the elements that are considered crimes against humanity within their domestic law. Um, it's important to note that crimes against humanity, that concept has not yet been codified in a dedicated treaty of international law. That's unlike genocide and war crimes, which have been, um, which have been uh, ratified uh, in a dedicated treaty. Now, despite the fact that it was not ratified in a treaty does not mean that it's not applicable um, to nation states. It is applicable to all the states of the world like genocide. So ratified or not, a nation that perpetrates crimes against humanity can be held responsible and should very well be held responsible. Um, you see that the key of this is this long list of, of um, acts that are driven or done against civilian populations. Um, and again, physical elements, it's actually physically carrying out those elements. The contextual element is when it is a part of a systematic attack delivered against civilian populations. And then of course the mental, the mental aspect is that this was done with knowledge. This was not an accidental, uh, for example, an accidental bombing of a village, that there was intent in doing that. So genocide, crimes against, uh, crimes against humanity, war crimes. War crimes, the definition is massive. The fact that it is a contextual element that it is done within an international or non-international armed conflict. So that is the context. And of course, then the mental aspect is the knowledge, the thought, the intent of doing this. Um, war crimes, as it says here, um, as part of a large scale commission. So war crimes, the concept probably developed towards the latter end of the 19th century in, in and into the 20th century. It was known as international humanitarian law, um, also the law of armed conflict. So that concept was, was coming along, um, I believe back to the 1860s, as we'll see. Uh, the Hague Conventions adopted some of those concepts in 1899 and 1907, where their focus was on, on specifically on warring parties and the prohibition of tactics and methods of warfare. There were other related treaties that evolved since um, and have been adopted and, uh, and modified. The Geneva Convention of 1864 and then subsequent Geneva Conventions, especially the four that took place in 1949, and then two additional protocols are called the additional protocols in 1977. So you put all that together and that leads to the development of the the concept of war crimes 
though, though the definition is, again, so massive we can't look at it. Um, there is no single document in international law that codifies all these war crimes. As you will see if you go to the website, the UN website, it is enormous. Um, lists, however, of these different crimes can be found in humanitarian law and criminal law treaties and also kind of customary law. So the law of the land, which is a law that would be, I think, understood to, to exist. So war crimes as well. And the last is ethnic cleansing. Um, ethnic cleansing has not been recognized as an independent crime under international law. We use the term ethnic cleansing, and I think we, I think we have a feel for what it means, but it doesn't actually, it, it's not recognized under criminal law, international criminal law, and there is no precise definition. So I think we have a feeling for what it means, but maybe, we, maybe it hasn't been codified yet and put into words for us. The, um, the elements of the crime, well, let, let's look at the com what's called the Commission of Experts. And so they gave another long list from murder through um, attacks on uh, field hospitals. And what they said was that these crimes constitute crimes against humanity. They can also be considered war crimes, and therefore they can also be blended into genocide. So ethnic cleansing has elements of the, the three that we previously saw. So the definitions are in a way murky, maybe it's that they're nuanced, um, they're huge, and I, I highly recommend checking out the www.un.org to look at those definitions. So that background now on where the concept and the word of genocide came from, then looking at those definitions of the four majors that we're going to be considering, genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and ethnic cleansing, the last three of which we will refer to unless we need to specifically refer to them by name, we will refer to them as mass human rights violations. So now what we need to look at is how has genocide, the, the term and the concept been treated since then? The place to go is uh, Dr. Gregory Stanton. He's the go-to person and he is the one who came up with the concept of, or the framework rather, of the 10 stages of genocide. You see his website located there www.genocidewatch.com. Again, a massive website that actually takes time to load. So if you're, if you're going there, just understand that it'll take a little bit of time to load for sure. Um, Dr. Gregory Stanton arrived at this series of steps or stages, as he called it, that indicated that not that genocide was imminent, but that it was potential. So steps along the way. Um, as, he, as he explains on the website, it does, it's not necessarily linear, meaning it has to go one through 10. It can go one through four and then drop back to three, or it can go one, two, three, and then up to six and drop back. So it's not, it's not a, a linear flow, but the stages exist there. So if we see signs of those, whether it's one, six, four, or eight, um, we know that the, that the area that this is taking place in is a potential hotspot, hot rather, uh, for genocide or some sort of mass human rights violation. Stanton's work includes the 10 stages, which again, I highly recommend you look at there. I will have a summarized list in the series one folder online um, that will just kind of parse it a little bit. But if you, if you want to go into depth, you will, um, you'll want to look at this website, genocidewatch.com. For our purposes here, at least we can look at the stages as classification of people. So classification, symbolization of people, uh, discrimination against people, the dehumanization of people, then organization, polarization, preparation, persecution, extermination, and then the 10th stage, denial. This originally began as eight stages, but it, uh, Stanton was able to kind of develop it further and include denial as a, uh, as a 10th stage. Again, this summary will be located in uh, the folder, and we will refer to these stages throughout this series going forward and see if we can identify um, along the way of the summarized history that I provide 
what the stage was that was taking place. Were there indicators that something, some sort of preventative action could have been taken? All right, so now we're gonna bring this all together. The, the story, the history of Lemkin and the creation of the word genocide the definitions of genocide and, the, and the, the other terms that comprise mass human rights violations and Stanton's 10 stages of genocide. We're going to add to that now the, um, the idea of the Geneva Conventions with a little bit more detail. So we're going to see that these treaties, that the, the first Gen Geneva Convention um, goes back to 1864. So this is towards the end of the American Civil War. There was this. There was the idea that that something was needed, not necessarily just because of the Civil War. So this beginning in 1864 and all the way up again through those additional two additional protocols in 1977. So to do that, we're going to look at a, a YouTube video, a PowerPoint, and then a, a simple worksheet that you can use um, in the class. And again, that can be done live, remotely in breakout sessions, however you want to do that. So this, this YouTube video, what are the Geneva Conventions? It is a verified site, the International Committee of the Red Cross. I, I wanted you to see that. This is a, uh, a verified site um, that we'll be using. This video runs four minutes and 19 seconds, and it will give us a good, uh, a good background for what we go into now, which is the last part of this introductory um, session which will be on the Geneva Conventions. If we rewind 70 years to 1949, the atrocities of war loom large in recent memory. More than 50 million were dead in the wake of World War II. Everyday people like you and me found themselves without adequate legal protections. And so we, as a world, vowed we must do better. A diplomatic conference again brings together in Geneva practically all the states of the world. Its effect will be to alleviate human suffering, to bring aid to all military and civilian persons incapacitated by wounds, sickness, captivity, or loss of their freedom. Strong limits were set on the brutalities of war through the Geneva Conventions to protect persons who aren't in combat. In the years that followed, this system of protective yet realistic rules enabled the Geneva Conventions to make their way from the halls of lawmakers to the battlefield where they mattered most. A powerful message rang in the air. People, no matter where they stand or what they support, must be treated with humanity. And states now had the responsibility to make sure grave breaches committed during armed conflict will not go unpunished, regardless of where they take place. Today, we see the profound impact the Geneva Conventions continue to have around the globe. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, military officials pledged to stop rape and other forms of sexual violence amidst a civil war. On vous encourage dans cette politique de sensibiliser bon, les autres militaires et par des dans la lutte contre les violences sexuelles, parce que ça porte atteinte à la vie de beaucoup de femmes. Je vous dis que ce n'est pas seulement atteinte à la vie de beaucoup de femmes, mais à la vie de beaucoup de familles. The stigma and destruction of dignity caused by sexual violence can upend the dynamics of communities. In Syria last year, more than two million people were in need of access to essentials like food and medicine. And yet despite the clear need for rapid and unimpeded access, only a handful of convoys were able to provide assistance. <laughs> Without humanitarian assistance provided for in the conventions, the losses and trauma could have been even more catastrophic. The Geneva Conventions created a system of preventive measures to ensure that breaches of conduct would not occur, with an obligation for states to train their armed forces on the laws applicable during warfare. 
з кожному військовому службовцю роздане правило введення воєнних дій, які передбачено ну, Женевською конвенцією. Щоразу, коли дозволяється фанса, відбирає всіх поранених хворих, тому що слів представників ворожої сторони та тупуються про них. Today, violations of the laws of war continue to be of concern to the ICRC. Well, states have asked the International Committee of the Red Cross to be the guardians of the laws of war. So we don't own the law. But it's our job to make sure that it's applied, that it's understood, as much as possible it's respected, and when necessary, that it's updated. Every time a healthcare worker crosses a checkpoint, or essentials like food and water are provided to families in besieged cities, it is made possible by the Geneva Conventions. Because even wars have limits. <laughs> Right, so even wars have limits, indeed. Very, very poignant quote, and that might be a um, that might be a, a place to start, a line to start with for an activity. So um, we'll do a, a we'll kind of overview a very simple, very brief um, activity, but maybe that could actually be added to it. You know, what what does that bring to mind? Even wars have limits. All right, so by looking at that video and then this PowerPoint that we're doing in the worksheet at the end, we wanna be able to, for students' purposes, explain what the Geneva Conventions are, what the, to identify how it relates, the Geneva Convention relates to war and the consequences of it, and to analyze how civilians and prisoners should be treated during war. So this is an activity or some questions that can be done, uh, again, whole class, um, in groups, uh, pods, or um, group tables, or even breakout sessions. So some basic questions that, that are a basic question or two that need to be, to be uh, answered. What are the rules of war? Should wars have rules? And um, you can have a group, you can do, again, a group discussion, or you can have uh, our whole class discussion, or groups work on and try to come up with a minimum of four, four rules. I don't think that would be difficult to do. Um, so groups of blank, whatever number works best for you, uh, you have blank minutes, and then bring, and bring that back and, and have a group discussion and see what, see what the different groups came up with. There'll be a lot of repeat answers, of course, but, but not all. There may be one or two that are, uh, are um, good and prompt some really good discussion in the class. So another... Um, idea to look at is uh, this as a, again, a um, whole class I don't think would, would work well for this. I think this would be good to, to again, breakout sessions or uh, group tables. So letting the students feel free to answer these questions honestly, which of the following, following would you allow to happen to a POW? Um, first, we may need to define POW, prisoner of war. Uh, the word reprisal may require um, defining. And the concept, the word indoctrination, the concept of political indoctrination, incidentally, we will see, we will see the results of political indoctrination when we look at uh, Tito in Yugoslavia in the towards the end of World War II and then post World War II, we will see the effects at least on one one person um, of political indoctrination. So those terms might need to be defined for students. Also, the word pillage um, may need to be defined. But then the questions to ask, you know, use of torture for punishment. I don't think any student is going to say yes for that. Use of torture for information. Some students may and that could be an interesting question to handle. So that'll be one of those that could be discussed and could be actually interesting to talk about. Uh, hostage taking, mass execution, reprisal. Reprisal could be one, uh, punishment for a deed that is done um, when the POW is now officially a POW, not a combatant, possibly. Uh, deportation and discrimination of any type, I don't think that would, uh, 
I don't think that would come up. Political indoctrination, though, may. Once defined, once students have an idea of it, they may, they may discuss how politically indoctrinating a prisoner might be, might be a, a, an okay thing to do. Um, and the rest, I don't believe uh, students would say yes to those. So some questions, again, that can be done as an activity. This can all be put together or parsed up. Some background information that can be uh, either discussed or handed out um, as a worksheet is what do, uh, a question, what do the Geneva Convention say about the treatment of POWs? Back to what we just looked at on the previous slide here. Um, if you felt that all of those things were unacceptable, then you agree with the Geneva Convention. So the Geneva Convention does not, does not make room for uh, the use of torture for information, uh, for reprisal, and for political indoctrination, things that we thought maybe, maybe students may say yes to. Uh, so a little brief background that maybe wasn't in the YouTube video is just some basics on the, on the uh, Geneva Convention. So there were close links with the Red Cross, founded by um, Henri Dunant, um, who initiated talks that ended up pro uh, producing the first Geneva Convention. So we associate the Red Cross and Red Crescent with, um, with the Geneva Convention. The idea, again, was to drop an agreement that would lessen suffering and atrocities of combat. Since the initial meeting, in 1864, the document has been updated. So we talked about the 1899 and 1907 Hague Conventions. We talked about the 1949 Geneva Conventions. We talked about the 1977 Additional Protocols. And that modernizing uh, of the document is to address modernizing of methods of combat. So in the 1860s, the American Civil War, the concept maybe of poison gas would not have been one that was readily accepted or even conceived. However, during World War I, it absolutely was, and it was employed. Just like post-World War II, maybe post-Vietnam, maybe into um, Iraqi freedom, the idea of, um, of bullets that flatten um, would not have been conceived. So those types of weaponry um, have to be addressed. And of course, going forward now with drones and remote remote methods of combat, those will be addressed as well. So maybe there'll be more uh, additions to the Geneva Convention as we go along. Um, good to know that the majority of the countries of the world have signed on that. So 194 countries as of January 2018, the last that um, I saw numbers for. So again, background of the Geneva Convention, you know, who, who does this, uh, who does this cover? What does this cover? Well, the Geneva Convention has rules that protect POWs, but wounded soldiers. So soldiers who are, have not yet been captured but are wounded, they're supposed to be treated a certain way per the Geneva Conventions. Civilians, absolutely. And then medical personnel in war zones. Uh, the people that the medical personnel are treating, so the sick and wounded, they are considered no longer part of a fighting force and therefore are vulnerable and therefore are entitled to medical care, whether seen as an enemy combatant or an ally, still to be treated uh, with, with proper appropriate medical care. The treatment would be done at places like field hospitals. You see pictured here, um, field hospitals, medical equipment, the staff who are, who are used there, who are working there, and the wounded were, are not to be attacked. These areas, which readily display red crosses and red crescents, are, are to be off limits. And, the, and those insignia, the cross and the crescent, are supposed to, to, um, to signify that. Enemy civilians, so again, we're getting now into a potential area where we could get into crimes against humanity, potentially ethnic cleansing as well. Um, enemy civilians ideally are supposed to be treated humanely and protected. And there's an, an emphasis even on the old and the young. So we saw with the Armenian genocide that the old and the young were the third part of the, of the tactic to, to commit genocide, to eliminate the Armenian people. They are vulnerable, especially once leadership and males of military, males and I suppose females nowadays, but males then of military age were eliminated. So now they had no protection civilians are 
supposed to be allowed to, to practice their own religion, stay in touch with their family and so forth. They're not supposed to have unjust punishments. And of course, this goes without saying, but it is covered there for sure. Women are not supposed to be um, sexually assaulted. Uh, prisoners of war, lastly, are supposed to be treated humanely. They're not supposed to be held in close confinement. They are not supposed to be expected to do work that is dangerous, unhealthy, or degrading. They are supposed to be protected from violence. They're supposed to be protected from acts of intimidation and insults. And they are not supposed to be held up for public curiosity. <clears throat> and stated, as we talked about before with reprisal, there, are, there should be no acts of reprisal. There is a worksheet that kind of summarizes this information for the Geneva Convention. So you have the YouTube video, this section of the PowerPoint that will be in the session folder as well, along with a very simple worksheet that tests retention of the information from the PowerPoint and the, work, and the, uh, the video, the YouTube video. So that brings together all the information, where the term genocide came from, um, genocide and other mass human rights violations defined, the different terms that we'll be using, the different philosophies of governance, all this information located in the session folder, um, the 10 stages of genocide per Dr. Gregory Stanton, the Geneva Convention designed hopefully to prevent genocide, um, and certainly war crimes and crimes against humanity. Um, bring that all together, and this is a good introduction for us as we, as we head into different um, different examples of genocide. So effective August 1, 2020, there will be session folder number two, and that will be on the Cambodian uh, genocide. That will be available, the, the, a recorded video and a session folder with materials will be included in, um, on the website. Within that folder, ideally, will be photographs, video clips, quotes, um, activities, um, enough to hopefully uh, apply not only gain some information, the historical part, which we'll cover via video, but also some practical applications for the classroom. It is not, <clears throat> excuse me, it is not necessary to have taken this first uh, session, although I think it's very important. So I will be referencing it probably in each of the following sessions that if you've not, if you've not gone over session one, highly recommend it because again, we define so much there that, um, I think it will help give some, certainly some background content, uh, context rather. Lastly, if you would email me, my email address provided, sam at hmcec.org with questions. Um, and also to let me know if you've taken the workshop. Very simple email, your name, the name of the workshop, the date that you attended or took the workshop. And if you are affiliated with a school, uh, or, or, or other organization, if you could let me know that to us. Just a simple email there. That will allow us, again, to help for tracking for information for the Florida Task Force um, on Holocaust education and for the Merrill Kohler um, Educator Series as well. So I really appreciate that. Um, until next month, I would like to thank you so much from the Holocaust Museum and Cohen Education Center. I look forward to working with you and seeing you next month.